This is Air Force Oral History Interview number 1361 with Otis F. Bryan. The interview dates are 14 and 15 December 1982, and the interview was conducted in Greeley, Kansas by Dr. James C. Hasdor. This is tape one of four, and both sides are recorded. All right, to begin the interview this morning, uh, Mr. Bryan, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your early family life. Uh, how large a family did you come from? I came from a family of 11 children. I was about the middle, the sixth one, and, and we lived on a farm over near Seymour, Indiana. And uh, uh, my father was, a, of course, a farmer, and I went to grade school at a country school. And then I went to high school at a little town, Tampico, and then I went to the University of Indiana for three years. And what year were you born? I was born January the 3rd, 1908. And uh, what uh, particular reason uh, made you interested in going into college then? Well, um, I had an older brother. <clears throat> I had a an older brother who had graduated from Indiana University and uh, then my older sisters had gone to universities and I thought I'd behoove me to work to, uh, and go to university too. So I went, selected Indiana University and I majored in mathematics and minored in chemistry and uh, did some engineering work. Uh, I might say as far as my family is concerned, um, the name Brian, uh, they came from uh, Tennessee originally and uh, my my great grandfather and William Jennings' father were brothers that information was given to me by my grandmother before she passed away many years ago uh, then the remainder of the family the remainder of the Brown family moved to Texas and Southern Illinois and that's where William J went to was Southern Illinois so uh, with that background, it behooved all of us to do the best we could there and go to the university and get an education. <laughs> do you keep in contact with the uh, uh, Brian Bunch that went to Texas? Uh, I've met a few of them down there. As one of my travels, I was in Texas quite a bit, but uh, and not specific, just as a casual acquaintance. They're located mainly around Bryan, Texas. Was that named yeah, after named them? Named after the broad group that went there. That's surprising you didn't wind up being an Aggie then. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what uh, prompted your interest in, in aviation? Well, I remember that very clearly. Uh, at Indiana University, I was quite uh, active in ROTC. And I was one of the in the higher the top uh, group, and in Jan in June, or May 1927, uh, that my group, my my squad, or my uh, is the infantry, my company, was taking an ROTC training at Fort Knox, Kentucky. And in those days, uh, we were treated as privates. You know, forget our training. And one of the things, among others, we had to do was to carry a 43-pound pack around on our back and a rifle and ammunition. A good close friend of mine, A.B. Farb, uh, and I were there. And when the news came that Lindbergh had flown to Paris, and we were out on the field there with the temperature about 110, carrying this weight around, gun traveling over there, and I decided right then and there it might be easier to be in a cockpit flying over the ground, I would be carrying that rifle around on the ground. So uh, I came back and uh, to the university that fall and contacted a gentleman who's dean of law, Colonel Paul V. McNutt, and he wrote a recommendation to me for the to the Air Force Air Corps at that time, and recommended me for a position as a flying cadet, which uh, came to pass that well, that winter. What year was this? Oh, this was in uh, 1927. And where did you take your flying training then? I took my flying training at 
basic training at Marchfield, Riverside, California, and then my advanced training at Kelly Field, San Antonio, Texas. Well, it was March and uh, Randolph were the... Uh... Well, this, excuse me, this was before Randolph was built. Randolph was not built That's until right. years later. That's right. That's right. 32, I think. Somewhere thereabouts, yes. All right, then what types of aircraft did you uh, train in back then? Well, we had uh, uh, PT-1s and 3s. I'll cover these pictures later. I can picture one of them. PT-1 was a small biplane with uh, an Italian Hisso engine in it. And that's what I soloed. And I took my first flight in that on uh, April the 2nd, 1928. <laughs> and six hours later, I took, made my first solo flight on April the 9th, 1928. 15-minute <laughs> flight, which I sh shall, of course, not, shall never forget. Did you have any uh, moments of doubt? No, I don't think so. You hear it back then, the washout rates were tremendous. Yes. Uh, when I got the appointment to uh, explore that comment, when I got my appointment as a flying cadet, I took my physical and mental examinations at, uh, at uh, Rantoul, Illinois. Um, there were 75 of us from Indiana and Illinois and Michigan and uh, Iowa gathered there to take uh, our physical examination and mental examination. Out of the 75, only two passed, <laughs> and I was fortunate enough to be one of them. When I took this examination, before I went in, though, I was only 19, and you had to be 20 to get in, get this appointment, or have your parents' written consent. Well, my mother wouldn't sign my written consent, so I automatically became one year older. I became 20 when I went <laughs> there. And then we went to March Field for our basic training, four months. And we had there, when we got there, there were 110 of us started in, and only 27 finished at March Field and went to Kelly. That was the uh, ratio that which they... Uh, called them washouts in those days, cadets. And of course you got washed out for practically anything. <laughs> Is there any particular reason why your mother wouldn't sign this paper? She thought it was, just, of course, like all mothers, she thought it was too dangerous back in those days for anyone to take up flying. They did have a high uh, attrition rate. Oh, yes. Yes, they did. And what was your first assignment then? Well, after Marchfield, then I went to Kelly Field for eight months, no, excuse me, I went to March Field for eight months, and then I went to Kelly Field for four months, and graduated, graduated then as what we call as a pursuit pilot. Today you'd call him a fighter pilot. And then I spent, that was in February of 1929, then I spent uh, February 1929 till June 1929 at Langley Field, Hampton, Virginia, as a pilot with the 2nd Bombardment Group. And in June, I became associated with the airline transcontinental air transport. Uh, who were some of your uh, classmates in flying school that uh, may have reached distinction later on? Do you remember? Well, there were several. One was Possum Hansel, General Hansel during World War II. I know him. You know him? Tommy Powers. He was uh, head of... Uh, a strategic air command for some time. He passed away several years ago. Right. And uh, then there were several others, uh, most of which became involved in World War II. I remember a wonderful fellow, Louis Parker. He was went to Europe to get his, he was a full colonel and he went to Europe to get his five trips over Germany. 
and then he was going to be assigned a, a group out in the Pacific for the Pacific War. And when on his fifth trip, he got shut down in Germany and spent the rest of the war in a uh, prison camp. And when he came back to Washington, the first thing he did was call me. And it was a wonderful scene, but he spent practically three years in prison camp. There were others. Uh, I forget their names. Uh, I don't have the names, but here was... The group, a fellow named Wallace, I think he was passed away, Hansel, Reed, Mickle, and there was a fellow named uh, uh, Saunders who did quite a job. They all, most of them were promoted to colonels and then several of them were killed in World War II. But I guess Powers and Possum Hansel were two of the outstanding ones. All right. Uh, your son uh, notes here in, uh, that you, uh, following your tour at Langley, that you had a, a flight in a free balloon. Uh, what was the occasion for this? No, I believe that must be an error. My father-in-law, my wife's father, was a colonel in the Air the Signal Corps, and he was a pilot of Free Balloon. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Pilot of Free Balloon. I think what my son might be re referring to was a parachute jump I made one time at Langley Field. I never have been in a Free Balloon, I'm sorry. Well, what was the uh, parachute jump all about? Well, they uh, wanted someone to jump for the movies back in those days, practice jump. And uh, of course, uh, they asked the last guy on the totem pole there, which happened to be at me at that time, if I would jump. And I said, sure. So we had to jump over right over the field, the center of the field. But there was a high tension line going on the east side of the field. And I had a j just enough drift for the edge of the balloon to hit the high tension wires after I came down. <laughs> And that was really exciting. <laughs> Not the jump, I forgot about the jumping, but it's a beautiful thing to ride down. But uh, the high tension wires, well, the balloon, the, uh, the uh, fabric just scraped them on the way down. And everybody thought I was going into them. And that, of course, they, you know, the movie and everybody else out there taking pictures and seeing this. <laughs> so I think that's what he probably refers to. Uh, did you have any aircraft accidents? Well, uh, not during that period. I've never had any real bad accidents. Uh, I had one where some engines had quit, maybe mess up a landing gear or something like that. But we, uh, I was with a fellow, a classmate of mine, uh, when he was checking out on a, a LB-5 bomber and both engines quit. We landed out in the woods and uh, tore it uh, all to pieces. One of it didn't kill both of us, but neither one of us got a scratch. <laughs> and I'd, I'd made that flight just after I'd taken a physical examination. And uh, when the commanding officer and everybody got out there, they were just amazed that we were still up walking around and nothing bothering us. <laughs> You must have had a rabbit's foot that day. Uh, they sure did. That's the only major accident I, I, where we had a lot of damage to the aircraft. Well, how long were you on active duty during this period? Well, from February to June that year. It would be about five or six months. Is there any particular reason why you uh, left the Air Corps at that time? Well, they were coming around hiring co-pilots, us younger pilots, for the airline. And the representative of the airline had just been there, and uh, several of my friends uh, went to the uh, airline, and I did too. Uh, I joined them. They resigned. In those days, you, you were just on active duty. 
and uh, he, he could get out at any time he wanted to. So that's how I got out. Uh, was I resigned? I got out, resigned at my active duty, and became a co-pilot with TAT, Transcontinental Air Transport, in St. Louis. You hadn't gotten a regular commission, or no. Any? Is this one of the things that uh, prompted you to go ahead and uh, uh, find work with the uh, civilian industry that you didn't have a regular at the time? Yes, yes, that's one thing. Uh, you could get you could get regular commissions down the road, but it, it wasn't like uh, they uh, did later on. You know, where they automatically gave you commissions when you graduate. I know in the early uh, days of the Depression, it was very difficult to get a, a regular commission. Most of the uh, young pilots served one year active duty and either reverted to enlisted status or had to get out altogether. Yeah. Well, we, uh, I don't think there was time limit on it, but you, today I think three years on active duty and then you, you had to get out or had to have a regular commission. But. Uh, at that time, there were very few aircraft, and uh, I, I must uh, mind you that uh, the total Air Force, Air Corps at that time, the total number of officers in the Air Corps at that time, was somewhere in the neighborhood of 300. Yeah. And you knew, you either knew them all or you knew them by name, is that close-knit group. And they didn't have many planes. They didn't have funds to build planes. All you see, what we were doing, the the PT-3s and the DHs we flew, and the old bombers were old wartime uh, leftover from World War One planes. So they were they were scarce, and there was no funds to build new planes for these groups, and a very small amount of funds, put it that way. They had the right field, the small scale, and some. Uh, uh, Companies, I guess, built a few airplanes for the Air Corps, but very few. So it wasn't, the morale was not high. It was a case of where you would, you know, here is a good job coming along and uh, airlines just starting up and getting on the ground floor. It looked rather attractive to us. Mm -hmm. Well, this company you mentioned that you went with, is this what became TWA later on? Yes, yes. It, uh, it had several changes. It was Transcontinental Air Transport, and then it was Transcontinental Western Air Maddox, and then it was Transcontinental Western Air, and then it was Transworld Airlines, and today I think it's, it's uh, TW, just plain TWA, I think that's the corporate name. But there were changes all through it. Was this a pretty small company itself at that time? Yes. We had uh, 34 17 first pilots, the captain was called a first pilot then, and 17 co-pilots. That was the first group. And where were, uh, where did you fly in particular during that? Well, first? I was based in St. Louis, and I flew mainly from St. Louis to Winoka, Oklahoma. And then I would also relieve some on vacation. The pilots want, you know, take time off for vacation. And sometimes I would go to Los Angeles, or sometimes I would go to uh, uh, Wayne Oka. We had pilot's bases, where we had a pilot base. What type of aircraft were you uh, flying then? Fords, tri-motor Fords. Was this an interesting airplane to fly? At that time it was. The tri-motor Ford was a well-built airplane. As a matter of fact, it is said that Henry Ford said if the tri-motor Ford, if they ever built one that caused a malfunction in the air to kill anyone, that would kill somebody, they would no longer be in the airline, airplane business. He quit. And those Fords were really built. They were put together and they were good airplanes in those days. And the ones that uh, crashed were the ones that were caused by weather or pilot error or something of that nature. But for the time they were excellent. I wonder if you could speculate why Ford uh, didn't continue in the aircraft business. I could only harbor a guess that uh, uh, you must recall now, we're talking about the period of 1929 and 30, right at the height of the worst depression in the world. 
I was telling somebody recently that the, we think unemployment is high now, but in 1933, unemployment in this country was 24.9 percent. <laughs> now, Henry Ford was busy building Fords, Model A Fords. Uh, so to answer your question, I can only suspect that the economic conditions prevalent at that time forced him into retrenching and he decided to do away with the, the airplanes because no one was buying any and uh, by that time Fokker had come along uh, importing tri-motor Fokkers from Holland and they were making quite a dent and really no one, no, air, no airline was buying any airplanes. So there's really not much use for manufacturers <laughs> to be in business in those days. So that's, that's about as good as I can guess as what might have happened. <laughs> well, your son noted that uh, you also flew the mail. Yes. Could you uh, go into some detail about that? And I must generalize some things here and ramble around over the air. First thing, uh, let me tell you how TAT was, came into being. In uh, 19, summer of 1926, summer, uh, no, summer of 19, summer of 19 and uh, 20, fall of 1927 it was, four men sat down to lunch at the Engineers Club in New York City. They were Paul Henderson, who was assistant postmaster, or postmaster general. And there was a lawyer named Cuthrell, Cuthrell, and there was a man named C.M. Keyes from the Pennsylvania Railroad, um, and another man, and then Lindbergh. And postmaster general Henderson was quite an avid enthusiast on aircraft. And while at the table, he pulled out of his pocket an envelope, and on it he had sketched the possibility of an airline flying at, not, at daytime, or taking the train at night from New York to Columbus, Ohio. They'd take the train at night out of New York. In the daytime, they would fly from Columbus, Ohio, in tri-motor Fords, passengers would, to Winoka, Oklahoma. And then at night, they would take the train from Winoka to uh, Clovis, New Mexico, and then from Clovis they'd fly the next day into Los Angeles. That would give uh, a passenger the ability to go from New York to Los Angeles in 48 hours, an unheard of time in those days. <laughs> and he passed this envelope around and said, uh, if you think this has merit, uh, let's discuss it. If you think it hasn't any merit, let's drop it. So they passed it around, they all started talking, they all agreed it had merit, they all decided that uh, they would get the Pennsylvania Railroad and the uh, Santa Fe to put up five million dollars to start the airline. They just talking, you know. Well that finally came to pass, that's what it is. And C.M. Keyes was made president, the corporate, uh, corporate organization was uh, set up later in the next year, and C.M. Keyes was president of it. And uh, he hired Paul Collins. Paul Collins was an old airmail pilot. Dog Collins, they, they called him. I don't know why he got stuck with that name. But he was a very intelligent fellow, but also had a tendency to be a little bit lazy. <laughs> the story goes that he was flying the mail from New York to Cleveland, across the Alleghenies in that weather district. And the weather got real bad, and he landed at an emergency airport called the postmaster and the postmaster sent out a truck and uh, the truck driver said um, well you'll have to load the mail out of the plane into the truck and he said what he said yes you'll have to load the mail out of the plane in the truck oh he said well to hell with it he took off and went on through the weather into cleveland rather than unload the mail i don't think that happened but that's a story they told him then uh, he was a great guy wonderful fellow he set up the necessary things he bought Ten tri-motor Fords. He built airports. He got the maintenance crew. He got the sales department. He got the uh, 
rights from Paul Henderson, the government, all those things had to be done and set up headquarters in the Scruggs, Vanderroot, and Barney building at St. Louis. Then when he's assembling these people, that's how I came in as a co-pilot when he hired the pilots in June of that year. So, uh, and what year is this now? This is, uh, this by this is uh, June or May or June of 29. Right before the big crash. Yes. So uh, you get around then uh, the um, the um, uh, five million was gone within a year, and Paul Henderson, as postmaster general, came forward and said, uh, "We'll give you a subsidy to fly the mail." But we will not give it to any duplicate routes. Any two airlines that flies over the same routes, you'll have to merge. So TAT, the first merger they made, was with uh, uh, both TAT and Western Air flew from Kansas City to uh, Los Angeles. Of course, TWA flew on to Columbus, Ohio. So they merged and called one company, Transcontinental Western Air. That was the first merger. And then they said as a result of that, uh, you can no longer, uh, or you must hire, get some mail planes, strictly mail planes, to take the mail through when the passenger plane cannot fly on account of weather. So they acquired 14 Northrop Alphas. And they first hired a bunch of pilots for, just outside pilots, for mail planes, for mail work. And the results were very bad. They crashed two or three of them the first three or four nights. So they, they took a bunch of us co-pilots off of the Ford and gave us some training and some training and put us on the mail planes. That's how they got, they got the mail plane flying. Well, how did this tie in with the military uh, handling the uh, flying of the mail? Well, uh, you know, it was a catastrophe when yes. they got involved in it. Yes, well, we flew the mail to Northup and did an excellent job, if I do say so. We learned to fly the instrument flying, took up instrument flying, flew weather, and we flew at long range. We had, these Northup Alphas had enough range that if we were going to Kansas City, St. Louis, and uh, couldn't get down to St. Louis, we could go, had enough fuel to go ahead to Annapolis, this kind of thing. This made it, made, we put a lot of flights through when uh, some of the other airlines flying uh, different type of mail planes didn't go through. Uh, to answer your question, we had quite a reputation then of flying the mail, and the airlines did. But you recall now we were in the Greatest Depression and Roosevelt had come on stream. Then everything went uh, changed. Uh, Roosevelt's post Postmaster General, Farland, what is it, Farland? Uh, you know who I mean. Yes, I do, but I can't think of it either. All right, we'll think of it in a moment. Falkland, Farland? Um, start with him. He said that when Postmaster General Henderson made these airlines get together, that they had collusion and divvied up all the airlines. <laughs> the airlines themselves divvied up what they wanted. And he said that was strictly illegal. Now this was this guy's name, Faulkner. Faulkner. And he was said, it Fowler? No. Close, but that's not it. Uh, then on uh, January, I'll have to check this day. January the nineteenth, nineteen thirty-four. See, after we'd flown mail for three years, he canceled all the mail contracts. Farley, Farley, Jim Farley. Farley, yeah, all right. He canceled all the mail contracts, every one of them. And he said the Air, the Air Force would fly the mail. He had checked with some officers, and they said, sure, they can fly the mail. <laughs> well, the Air Force was, was not equipped to do any night flying. See, all of these planes mostly we flew at night. They were not equipped. They were not trained. They didn't have the equipment to fly. 
the didn't have the radio stuff that needed to fly the instruments and so forth. And in about the first uh, two weeks, they killed ten pilots, something like that. So then they opened it all up for bids again. And this time, this time when they opened it for bids, they said no more single engine air mail planes. They said you'll have to carry the mail on your passenger planes. And that's when the United used to fly from Chicago to uh, Dallas, for instance, through Kansas City and Tulsa, Oklahoma City. Well, Braniff underbid them and got that route. That's how Braniff got in the air mail business. Of course, it's unfortunate today. <laughs> they got out recently, too. Uh, TWA got its roots back from uh, uh, from uh, New York to Los Angeles over the summer. United Airlines received a route from New York to Chicago to Salt Lake City to Los Angeles and to San Francisco. And then Northwest Airlines got the northern route from Chicago to, New, to uh, uh, Washington, Seattle. And American Airlines got the route, the southern route. Then there were other smaller airlines operating as regional air carriers, got mail routes in, in this new bid for air mail routes. So uh, it was unfortunate, going back to the Air Force, it was unfortunate in a way, but actually, uh, the the uh, uh, things that uh, came about because of the Air Force's inability to fly the mail really made the Air Force at that time. People began to realize the Air Force would have to have good equipment, they'd have to be trained in instrument flying, and the pilots would have to be trained, with, which evolved from all of that. So it did have some good after all. After all. It was, some of those things seem terrible at the time, but usually there's some good comes out of it someplace. Well, did this hurt the uh, commercial airlines during the period when the mail was taken away from them? No. Uh, we had to refinance time to the General Motors, for instance, owned, had to come in with money on TWA at one time. And then, uh, uh, oh, Lehman Brothers, a little after that, bought out TWA. And then Hertz, John D. Hertz, bought the company. All these changes were brought about because they were losing money and they'd put in a million dollars, but in a year the million dollars would be gone and have to get somebody to put in more money. Of course, the airlines being popular those days, we had a wonderful fellow at the head of it when uh, TAT was merged with. Uh, Western Air to, call, uh, to become uh, Transcontinental Western Air, a fellow named Jack Fry was made executive vice president. And a fellow named Richard Robbins from Santa Fe was made president. But then when he had this airmail cancellation in February of uh, 34, Farley accused uh, some of the presidents of being present at this meeting where the airlines so divvied up the mail contracts in collusion, and he accused Robbins of being present. So uh, Robbins was not permitted to be in the airline, the new airline. And Fry, Jack Fry, who had been a very capable executive vice president, was made president of the company. And as to Fry's ability, he was a wonderful fellow, promotion and foresight and hard work that steered TWA through all of this to the World War II area and ended up with the best routes in the world of any airline. How were you doing in the way of promotions during these years? Well, I was very fortunate being in the right place at the right time. Uh, I started in as co-pilot. Six months later I was made first pilot. I flew first pilot on Tri-Motor Forge when I was 20, uh, 21 years old. And then after the mail cancellation, I flew forwards for about a year. Then I was made uh, uh, division chief pilot of the Eastern Division. I had all the pilots, charge of all the pilots flying east to Kansas City. And I handled that for about two years. And then the chief pilot, he wanted somebody to come in and uh, do his paperwork more than anything else, I think. So he selected me to come in and be assistant chief pilot. 
of the whole system. Then in uh, uh, the fall of 1939, he was killed in an aircraft accident at Boeing. And so I replaced him then as chief pilot of the whole company in 1939. Then uh, I served in that position for about two years. And when uh, the United States, uh, before the war was declared, was sending uh, equipment, airplanes to England under Len Lease, uh, many pilots were trying to fly him from Gander to Gander, Newfoundland to Prestwick, Scotland, fly these planes over because the subs, they couldn't ship them over. And the results were disastrous. They weren't trained properly to fly that kind of weather. They just picked up random, you know, barnstorming pilots picked up from here. They weren't expected to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. We didn't have the equipment. And in those days, you didn't have any radio. Um, that's another matter. We navigated mainly by celestial navigation, but that's a little. Then uh, General Arnold uh, came to Jack Fry in Kansas City in May of 1940, and he said, "We want you to uh, set up a school, flight training school." He said you go find an airport, the Army base that you could use and take your, some of your pilots and crews and set up a school and train these pilots, these civilian pilots, to fly across the Atlantic. So train them as at least as a workable team and do what you can to get them in shape so they can fly an airplane from uh, Gander to uh, Prestwick. Well, that was not too difficult within itself if you had the basic pilot because you could almost tell him, you know, step by step what to do, give him a book. So. It's, he said, I want the best man that you've got to head that up because he said, this is important. He said, we can't do it. The Air Force can't do it because we're not at war. We're under land lease. And uh, he said, you have a fellow that has a pretty good, I'm not being, uh, <laughs> I'm being a little modest here. He said, you have a fellow that has a pretty good reputation. He says, I know he's a celestial navigator and he did some work at Seattle on the Stratoliners that you build, and he was up there for a while and I saw him talk to him and he said I think he'd be a good man for this and Jack said well Jack Fry said well who, who who's this and he said Otis Bryan he said if you can get if you can put him in charge of this school let him take off I said I think we'll have it in good hands so I was selected I had no choice I was just went for chief pilot of that so I set up Eagle Nest Flight Center out at Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we took, gave these people intensive training, the crews, the engineer and the navigator and uh, the two pilots on uh, B-24s, four-engine bombers, for 30 days. And they got pretty good in 30 days. Then we shipped them up to Newfoundland where they started firing these aircraft across. This was a contract thing with, yes, uh, with the, with the uh, U.S. government. Then when war was declared, did I say 1940? That was 1941. I made a mistake on that. that. That date when we set up the school was May of 1941, not 40. I served as chief pilot from 1939 to 1941. To this time, I was transferred to this. So then when uh, Pearl Harbor came along and war was declared, we had five stratoliners, we, I say TWA, four engine transports, the only land planes that could fly across the ocean. Pan Am could fly their boats, but they were slow and cumbersome, and uh, uh, we had the only land planes. So uh, the, the Air Force came and bought them and said, we want you, Mr. President of TWA, to set up uh, an airline from uh, Washington, D.C., to Cairo, Egypt, with these five planes. He said, we'll furnish the fields, the fields will be there, but he said, we want your people to take care of them and all the work, which was uh, modified somewhat a little later, but basically that was it. So I was out at Albuquerque, the school, working night and day out there. And, uh, after Christmas, this, this happened just before Christmas, after Christmas I came home and uh, 
or I didn't come home. We, my wife was our family was out there. I came to Kansas City to go down in Southern Reserve to do a little quail hunting. We had a few days old. And when I got off the plane, the president's aide was there, and he said, Mr. Fry wants to see you. And I was dirty and tired, you know, been riding most of the night. I said, well, let me clean up, and uh, I'll come down. He said, no, he wants to see you now. So I went down, and uh, he talked, and he told me about selling these airplanes. And he said, we've got to get someone to uh, uh, take this division over, get the proper help and everything, and set this up. And he said, General Arnold, again, has suggested you. So uh, I said, well, uh, I came here to go quail hunting. He said, well, how long are you going to be down there? I said, well, three or four days. Well, he said, take my plane and go down there and come back this evening. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, that was how I got into that. Then after I flew uh, Roosevelt, I set up that division from Washington, D.C. It but later expanded quite large. We had 7,000 people there when the war was over. So I set that up, and then uh, after the first flight of Roosevelt to Casablanca, that was his first flight, why they made me a vice president of TWA, an officer of the company, and put me in charge of all of their war contracts. We had that and we had two tra uh, two modification centers here and then I, we were, had another unit that was doing some secret test work. So I had charge of all of that during World War II. Then after World War II, I was made uh, general manager and set up the International Division because we'd been flying as far as India. Set that up after World War II and then uh, problems began to develop in the company with Jack Fry and Howard Hughes, which is quite a story. <laughs> well, so we'll, does that give you a chronological uh, uh, yes. order? Yes. Uh, well, was it during the time that you set up this school in Albuquerque that you first came into contact with Arnold? No. Uh, the first, I'll tell you how that, that occurred. The first B-17s, you're familiar with them, right? flying fortresses. Uh, were assigned to the 2nd Bombardment Group at Langley Field, Hampton, Virginia. Bob Olds, who was a full colonel in, was commanding officer of the group. He invited me down to spend a month there on active duty and to check out on the B-17. See, up to that point I'd never flown anything but, uh, but Fords and mail planes. Uh, check out on the B-17s. But he knew I had uh, technical experience in mail and weather and so forth, and he wanted me after his suit to give him a detailed report on my observation of these planes. That was his purpose in having me down. So I did. I went there, and was, I think it was the month of June 36, and I spent a Langley Field doing this. Then when I finished, uh, I wrote a 15-page report on various components, how they fit in. Some were doing excellent, some were marginal, and a couple would be doubtful, which the Bob Olds appreciated because these are things he's trying to get done and had needed a little help. So on my report, and I gave a copy of this to Mr. Fry, Jack Fry, and at the end of my report, uh, I said that this B-17, if the turbo superchargers were limited, limited eliminated and a different engine used and a different fuselage, this had the possibility of being a good airline transport plane. And I went on to tell why in detail. So I didn't think anything more of that. And then about two years later, Mr. Fry called me up the office. I was uh, uh, assistant chief pilot at the time and said, uh, uh, we're building this plane. The tra the Boeing 307 Transport, which was exactly what I had uh, suggested. It was the same wing, same structure and everything, different fuselage, different engines, and they put some other things in. They put uh, pressure. First pressurized job was a Boeing 307. So he said, I'd like, I talked to Harlan, that was my boss, Harlan Hull was chief pilot. He said, I talked to Harlan, and I'd like for you to go up to Boeing and take over the design and engineering of the cockpit because we'd always had fussed, I'd fussed at him at times because uh, 
or you get in one of those Fords. Some engineer had never flown and never been in a pilot position, you know, would design where the instruments go. You might have the turning bank over here and the rate of climb here and the altimeter down here, and it was a, it was a sort of a hodgepodge of instruments. So I spent quite a bit of time designing an instrument panel with the basic instruments, the flight instruments. Then I put the engine instruments someplace else around, but the pilot had a basic panel. All he had to do was look at these six instruments there to fly by instruments. And while I was doing this, they were building quite a few flying fortresses at Seattle, and General Arnold came by one day to look at the plane, look at the Stratoliner. And I showed him what I'd done and went, spent quite some time talking to him about it. And that was really my first uh, contact with him. So when he wanted the pilots training to fly over from Newfoundland to Prestwick, well, he, he remembered me from that. That's how he got. So that was my first contact with him. What about Tui Spots? I didn't know Spots too well. I just met him and uh, I talked to him at times, and I, I think I flew him a couple of times on the trip over. And he was uh, he was not one of my I, I, just because I didn't have contact with him. He was not a personal friend like some of the others were, like Arnold and these others were. He was a great officer at Tui Spots. He did a lot for us. What was your uh, appreciation of uh, General Arnold? General Arnold, to me, was the one man for that job during World War II. He was a pilot. He had an excellent personality. He had a charisma that uh, he could get people to do things, do the impossible at times. On the other hand, he was tough and uh, run a tight ship and made people adhere to the rules. And it took all those. And then the, probably the most outstanding thing he had was uh, uh, General Marshall had a lot of confidence in him. You see, at that time, the Air Force, Air Corps, was under the Army. Uh, he was very capable. He was foresighted. He was big enough to see that, uh, well, so many officers in World War II, started World War II, had too limited vision. They couldn't see what was necessary to fight Germany and all the things that were going on over there and the logistics and uh, the supplies and the personnel. And after all, uh, we had about uh, 13 million men fighting at the end of World War II and thousands and thousands of pilots and uh, airplanes and so forth. So it took a man of that caliber. And I don't suppose there was a, a half a dozen men in the Air Force that were capable of doing it. Would you term him a workaholic? Yes, I would think so. Uh, he, he loved to work. He, 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 got a, he didn't stay in the office. He got out in the field. He got with the men. You know, it uh, eventually caused him some severe health problems. Yes, he had a, I'm a little bit familiar with that, he had a heart attack, I don't know how severe, how bad, near the end of the war. And uh, Marshall wanted him to retire. And I think Roosevelt did too. Yeah. And he talked to him and he said, no, let me go ahead. And said, if I kick the bucket, that's all right. He said, I want to finish this job. And so he talked to him and he stayed in. <laughs> He felt, you know, his duty. Well, were you actually brought on to active duty yourself during the war? No. Well, yes and no. On the flight to Yalta, I was uh, running this division. And I was, uh, uh, took my own, we were commercial pilots under contract to the, the Air Fairing Command at that time, Bob O's outfit. And I was civilian on that flight. On the next trip, I was ordered to active duty, and my crew was ordered to active duty. I selected my crew and was ordered to active duty, and I was a major on that trip. <laughs> then on to Yalta, I was ordered to active duty as command pilot and uh, promoted to lieutenant colonel. <laughs> well, uh, were you actually uh, credited with any service time for doing this, or how did that oh, work? Yes, yes. 
Yes, I suppose I've had a total of two years service time, counting my training time and everything. And then active duty during some of the years after that. Two, you know, two weeks or a month active duty occasionally. All right, before we uh, specifically get into these various trips you made with the president, uh, you mentioned uh, Howard Hughes a few minutes ago. Would you uh, go into some detail of your association with him? Well, let me start again back a little bit. This may be one of those sensitive areas, some of the things I'm going to tell you. You'll have to be the judge. I, I trust you to be the judge on this. Certainly. Uh, I don't think there's anything here that's going to be obnoxious, but there might be. When John D. Hertz in 1938 owned TWA, we'll call it TWA, Transcontinental Westerner. He ran it, they said, like a, a rental car rental agency. <laughs> the two top men, Jack Fry and Paul Richter, was executive vice president, a very capable man. Those two. Paul was a solid day-to-day -day type of fellow. Jack was a more visionary, planning in the future type of fellow. They worked well together. Uh, they became very discouraged with Hertz. Uh, it got to the point where they decided to resign without going into the details. It reached that point. So they talked and said, well, what will we do? Both of them had flown as pilot in Hell's Angels when Howard Hughes made the movie Hell's Angels. They both had flown as pilot. Both knew Howard. So they also knew that uh, Pacific Air Transport, the airline that later became part of United, flying from San Diego to Seattle, a fellow named P.G. Johnson owned it, was for sale at a very good price. They knew that. So they called Howard and said, we'd like to uh, come out and talk to you. Howard said, fine, come ahead. So they went to Los Angeles and uh, met in one of Howard's houses. He always kept two or three extra houses around to hold important meetings and has security around them where no one can get into them or at least damn sure no one would be overhearing what they said. So they came in there one Sunday morning and talked to Howard all morning, gave him a plan, and told him it hurts some of the things. They were polite about it. They said, he, it's his airline, he can run any way he wants to, but we just can't stay there. So we'd like to see you buy this airline, running up and down the coast here, and let us run it for you. So they talked about all the details, about buying it, the price, and how much it cost, and what they could operate, and the aircraft, and the problems like that all morning. Then they finally went to lunch. And after lunch, they came back about three or four o'clock, and they said, when they sat down at the table, the first thing Howard said was, uh, he looked at him, said, why don't we buy TWA? <laughs> that took them both back, you know, because TWA was, at that time, a very large company. He said, well, we, we didn't think that you would, uh, we think that's possible, but we didn't think you'd want to put that kind of money, that amount of money into an airline. He said, yes, I think that would be a good idea to buy TWA. <laughs> So Jack Fry came back to Kansas City, his office was here, and got the stockholders list. Well, wait a minute. So they talked this over in detail. And the next day, I think they had further meetings. And Howard told Jack, he said, you go back and buy all the stock you can of TWA. He said, buy it. And he said, uh, Hughes Tool Company will take care of the transactions and pay for it and so forth. He said, you buy it as cheap as you can, of course, but buy control. So Jack came back and he got the stockholders list and uh, he got the names of everybody and everything started buying the stock. And uh, I'm not just sure how much he bought, but it was a little over 50% of the stock of TWA for Howard Hughes at that time. The average, the stock, I think, was uh, 
cost him between seven and eight dollars a share, the average stop of that. So uh, uh, that's how Howard Hughes got into TWA. I got this story from Jack Fry himself, who told it to me. We were close together later on, and uh, he told me in detail about this. So I know it's uh, true. Well, how long did uh, Howard Hughes retain this uh, these shares in TWA? Well, then later on he kept buying himself, and I think he finally got up to around 70% ownership. And then during World War II, uh, well, the Constellation was an airplane that he and Jack Fry worked on prior to World War II. They would have had that airplane flying before the, anyone knew it of the competitors. That is, uh, there were only four people in TWA knew they were going to build a Constellation outside of Fry and Hughes and Richter. And they swore Lockheed to secrecy. And at that time they built, Lockheed built, took a hangar and built two, uh, made two hangars out of it. You had to go through the same door to get to each one of them. But on the right was building the huge bomber, B-19. Does that ring a bell? B-19, there was only one built, a big bomber. And on the left there was a secret door and that's where they built a constellation. And they had it just about ready to fly when World War II came along. And of course the Air Force decided to build uh, the Douglas C-54 for the transport during the war and they had put a stop on the building of the constellation until later on in the war. But that airplane would have been out and would have been test hopped, flown, and none of our competitors knew what was even being built. And Howard and Jack Fry did most of the work on this themselves. And that's the kind of a fellow he was. He was leaning towards the technical side. He was more of a technical man than uh, anything else. So then after the war, or later in the war, they got permission to go ahead and build it. They built it and flew it and it became quite an airplane after the war. Built hundreds, I, assume, I don't suppose they built it. I suppose it did build hundreds of them someplace. Now, during this period, uh, at the end of the war, near the end of the war, uh, Jack Fry asked for me to make a memo on how many constellations we had need for the airline after the war. And I prepared a rough memorandum for him and uh, estimated it'd take about uh, $80 million dollars to buy these aircraft and get them in service and the parts and everything. He raised a figure to a hundred million and then went out and talked to Howard. And Howard says, well, I think your hundred million is a little low. Let's make it a hundred and twenty million. And he said, you borrow forty million, let the company borrow forty million uh, from some uh, insurance company, wherever you can borrow it. And uh, I will put in 40 million out of Hughes too, and we'll issue 40 million dollars worth of common stock. That'll give us 120 million, and we'll go to town. Well, uh, then at the end of the World War, we had the pilot strike, which was distasteful to a lot of us, and that cost a lot of money. And then the airlines, down just where they were recently, they just didn't have any passengers, frankly. So they started losing a lot of money. And we borrowed 40 million from uh, the Prudential Life Insurance Company in New York. I know I was in New York at the time and I was an officer, so I signed the papers on that loan. Then when it came time, there was a little difference between Howard and Jack. There was a little friction built up. Then Howard held up on releasing the company to issue the stock or to put in his own 40 million. And finally, he decided not to do either one. And that put the company in an awful bind. So they were struggling and that caused friction within and the pilot strike and everything. And it caused uh, a severance between Fry and Hughes. 
No, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I did, I'm not sure, and I've never been told whether Howard fired Fry or Fry resigned or quit. But I know there's a lot of trouble there, and Rick, Richter did too. Richter resigned. I know that. So then several of the other officers left. So that put Howard Hughes, and he started to take more of an active interest in the airline. And that put Howard in a position where, uh, well, he was rather difficult to get along with because he didn't work during the day. He started his work at 8 o'clock at night and worked till 5 or 6 in the morning. I asked him one time why he did that, and he said, well, I can't work during the day. So if I'm out during the day, everybody wants to talk to me, and I can't get anything done. So if I go there at 9 o'clock at night and work till 7 o'clock in the morning, no one bothers me, and I can get a lot done. That's why I do it. Then, then the airline began to have problems. So then he started to finance this other 80 million and so forth, and I, he had trouble doing that. He brought in, uh, then he put Lamont Cohill, who was uh, in his president, and he wasn't worth a damn. He stayed about a year and went someplace else. And then they put uh, Ralph Damon came in. He couldn't get anything done as president. He died. Then Carter Burgess came in as president. He couldn't get anything. And then George Spader came in as president. And this was about the 1950, late 50s. And that's when then the Mellon Bank at Pittsburgh had always wanted to get a hold of, I've been told, Hughes Tool Company. 